Welcome, welcome, welcome to Pedagogical Science Institute School Student Support Program, session number two in geography. I am Mr. P. Mbuyisa, again, happy to have you guys in my classroom once again. Um, we are going to be continuing from where we left off in the previous session. So you'll remember that we had said our part two video on grade 10 and 11 revision will be on the golden rules that you must always remember for you to master this section being climatology. So in our session outline, that's what we have. We have our climatology golden rules, just for emphasis. Without wasting any time, let's get to it. Rule number one um, is what I want us to think about for starters. But then before that, uh, it's important for us to understand why, um, in a way, is the work break broken down in terms of rules and why is it important for you to remember these rules um, as you are working with um, the content in climatology right now you need to always remember that um, as we said in the previous session the, the, the knowledge you're working with is scientific in nature so um, there are certain things that remain constant um, or static or stagnant or a common throughout the section of work you are dealing with and if you understand these things and you remember these things it's easy for you to relate to them and access them as you are studying work in this particular uh, session right a section right of work and um, that's why you need to always remember the 12 rules we're gonna discuss um, in this session. The first rule then, let's just get to it. The first rule says, to master climatology, always think about how air would, would act or behave. Um, this is very important. Remember, in the previous session, we had said climatology basically studies the behavior of air. And remember, air is found in the atmosphere. And we said the atmosphere is the layer of um, gases that surrounds the earth so for you to understand the atmosphere you need to look at how do these gases relate to each other how do they behave in relation to each other and how does that affect the atmosphere so what influences does the behavior of this air have on our atmosphere and we also then think about the latter to say how do the different layers or spheres of the earth affect the atmosphere as much as the atmosphere affects these layers so how does the hydrosphere how does the lithosphere and how does the biosphere uh, affect how the atmosphere will behave so we it goes back to the first point to say how does this atmosphere um, act in relation to the changing conditions so for us to understand this now we, we think about when temperature changes how does the air behave um, when the chemical composition of the atmosphere changes how do you expect um, the atmosphere to behave how does it react why is our atmosphere enabling for life to exist on earth so that's the central question that we need to sort of answer right in this um, rule and that's what the rule actually addresses now you'll remember that in grade 10 you were taught the layers of the atmosphere now the layers of the atmosphere are classified or are categorized you see now it comes back to the last um, the second last scientific process school uh, these layers are categorized according to the temperature for starters so we use temperatures to categorize 
the layers or how the atmosphere is divided. Uh, with and and remember that in grade ten you were taught this basic goal to say the higher you go, the colder it becomes. So the layers of the earth are a perfect representation of this to say that as you um, increase altitude. And as you increase the height above sea level, which is what altitude is, what happens to the, the, the temperatures in the atmosphere? And uh, that's what we would like to um, emphasize or put emphasis on. So you notice that the first layer that extends from zero altitude to 20 kilometers um, is what we call the troposphere. So the troposphere that's the layer where me and you are at at this point. We are, we live in the troposphere. So temperatures in the troposphere extend from um, 60 degrees Celsius or centigrade to de negative 30 degrees centigrade. If you you like to, or rather. Uh, let me just get a precise figure to negative 40 um, degrees centigrade. So that's what you have in the troposphere. Sorry about that. Um, and then soon after the troposphere, uh, the layer that begins over there is what we call the stratosphere. The stratosphere. So the stratosphere is the second layer we look at. So the stratosphere has an ozone layer. And remember that ozone is a chemical compound represented by an O3, right? It's represented by an O3. Let me just write it down here. Sorry for the skewed writing again. Yeah, so I think that's clear. So it's ozone, that is ozone, O3, and it's a chemical compound that is very important for the earth because it protects us from harmful solar radiation, right? And, and uh, we, you were taught now in grade 10 that uh, because of human activities, which have led to a lot of pollution being released to the atmosphere, the ozone layer is being depleted. Remember, you were taught about ozone depletion. So it's being depleted. And as a result of this, these harmful, um, this, this harmful radiation is entering the atmosphere and thus affects uh, our, our, um, our, our natural environment and in human it may even lead to um, diseases such as skin cancer right so you were taught that anyways the, the main focus is uh, us looking at the changes in temperature so uh, we are looking at how does temperature respond in relation to changes in temperature so you'll, you'll see that there are changes in temperature with each sphere and it's going on the negative side of things right um, now after the stratosphere the sphere that we have is known as the mesosphere the mesosphere is known as the coldest sphere we have so the mesosphere is the coldest sphere here is the mesosphere the coldest sphere because temperatures there extend up to negative 80 degrees as you can see over there negative 8 degrees celsius so those that's 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 what we have in the mesosphere and soon after that we have the last sphere which is the hottest um or rather one of the coldest so so i don't know why i'm saying the hottest um it's also uh, one of the coldest and that's the sphere we call the thermosphere um, so that's the last sphere it's in the outermost of the earth right um, and why is it why is it uh, cold like that we can think about why is that it's simply because uh, you'll remember that the sun doesn't directly heat the atmosphere it heats the ground and the ground is the one that is responsible for heating the atmosphere and the and and and, and thus um, this warmed up air that goes to the atmosphere um, 
we can say it reaches the thermosphere while it says frozen already and um, that's what will make that sphere to be really cold um, over there. Uh, let's look at then how does temperature again uh, or how do we classify the atmosphere according to the functions of gases. So we have the ozonosphere and the ionosphere. Now the ozonosphere um, is, is the sphere that has a, a really high concentration of ozone. Remember we talked about ozone um, when we talked about the ozone layer. And, um, and you'll know that the, the ozonosphere um, has sufficient, like it's a sufficient block um, that, uh, that sort of prevents ultraviolet rays uh, from the sun from, from really affecting the lower lithosphere, right? Or the surface of the earth. While the ionosphere uh, is, is, the, is the layer that enables for um, wireless transmission, radio waves uh, to be transmitted from the earth and reflected back to the earth. Uh, because the ionosphere like, is rich in ions, um, hence it's given that name, ionosphere. So it's the sphere that allows us to have uh, satellites around the earth that allow for network transmission or radio wave transmission. Um, yeah, so though that's the chemical composition that allows for that. While now the, the last, last uh, basis of classifying the atmosphere, and um, that is, it's, it's based on the chemical composition of the gases. So you note that um, we have the homosphere and the heterosphere. Now, the homosphere um, is very important. Now, that's the sphere we live in. Now, remember, homo means uniform. So the homosphere has a uniform distribution of um, the gases. So all the type of gases we have, uh, in a way, are in a uniform distributary format. Um, and that is really good for life because some plants and any uh, some plants need certain gases for them to exist and perform their processes so the homosphere has an equilateral distribution of or a uniform a distribution of gases while the heterosphere and um, remember hetero now means distinct or different so uh, we have these gases being layered distinctly or separated from each other so the first layer uh, from the first layer of gases in the heterosphere is nitrogen followed by oxygen then helium then hydrogen and we know that hydrogen tends to absorb um, some heat uh, some more heat hence the thermosphere um, um, is deemed as such it's given the name thermosphere because it absorbs a lot of heat and um, because of uh, hydrogen being the predominant gas that exists there. So remember rule number one to master climatology, always think about how air would act and how air acts is influenced by changes in temperatures, the functions of the gases and the, chemi the chemical composition of the gases. Let's look at the next rule. Rule number two says, warm air is less dense and therefore will always rise warm air is less dense and therefore will always rise so you need to always remember the relationship between density and temperature very 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 important very important now you must know that density and temperature are always going to be opposite to each other so when we have higher temperatures the density is going to be low. When we have uh, low temperatures, the density is always higher. Now, warm air particles gain heat energy, right? We know that. So when you warm up 
air particles if you look at the pot here so let's say there's water there when you warm this water up and um, this liquid format uh, absorbs this heat energy and uh, we call that heat the energy that has been observed uh, absorbed rather latent heat now this makes these water particles to be energized if you look at them here so they start bubbling up and they flow away from each other as you can see um, here so they flow away from each other and uh, they start now filling up the atmosphere in a form of gases right so you need to always always remember um, this this is what happens now another important thing then is to think about um, why then we say it is less dense now if you look at uh, particles in a liquid substance that are compacted together um, you see that they tend to be more heavy and um, so they are more dense while if you look at particles that are separated from each other they tend to be less dense so these section of part of, 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 of this section of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the 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 diagram is representing warm air because warm air is less dense so uh, because of this it will always rise and um, so that's where the rule comes from now how does that then affect us so it takes us to what we talked about in the previous session. So because of this, um, warm air, irrespective of what system it is in, it will always rise. So in the previous session, we talked about convection, right? Uh, which is air rising to the upper atmosphere. And as it rises, it cools down or condenses to form clouds. So um, warm air is very convectional. Uh, at some points, warm air is also cyclonic. And why do we say so? So what do it will do is that, uh, remember air in, in, in a low pressure system or a cyclone uh, will come to a central point as it flows. So it will converge to a central point and um, it will then rise from clouds. So it is cyclonic in nature. Um, again, warm air may form France. So it, it is frontal in nature, it can form France. So when it submerges or meets with cold air, warm air will always do what it does best. So it will just rise. And when it rises, um, it forms clouds as well. You see, so it condenses and forms clouds. So it never mixes with um, cold air. And in an orographic uh, situation uh, in a mountain, it will always behave the same way again. So it will rise um, when expected to do so. And as it rises, it will form clouds um, in that mountain. The leeward, uh, sorry, the windward side of the mountain um, and will form a rainfall as a result. Uh, on the other side, we have your rain shadow, uh, that side, and remember that side is the um, leeward side. So this is the windward and the leeward side. Yeah, so that's how warm air will always behave. Now, how does cold air behave? That's rule number three. Cold air is, is more dense, thus it will always sink. So looking at our density scale again, so what is more dense is the colder air. So it is compacted, it is closer together, so it will always sink while the warm air will rise. So when density increases, what happens to temperature? It decreases. So that's the relationship you must always remember. So that's how um, your cold air will behave. Now, another thing about warm air, warm air is, mo is mostly moist. Warm air is, mo is mostly moist. So we always say warm, moist, rising air, simply because warm air is mostly 
moist. And why is it moist? Takes us to our diagram here. So remember that we said radiation from the sun will heat the surface. And as much as the surface is the lithosphere, it also has some fragments of the hydrosphere, uh, water bodies there. So these water bodies will uh, have their water evaporating. So this air evaporates, remember air evaporates once it has uh, reached its boiling point, right? Its highest temperature. So it will start uh, vaporizing forming our water vapor, so that's what happens. And remember, after it rains, we also have surface run off water on the surface, so that water as well, um, when exposed to insulation, also tends to evaporate to the atmosphere. That's why we say warm air is mostly um, moist. And you need to take note that I did not say it is always moist, but I said it is mostly mostly moist and why do i say so because the instances where when that is not the case so uh, we'll talk about that of course in sessions to come i'll explain that briefly again today now uh, you were taught the water cycle right so this is what the diagram is basically showing us a 3d view of what will happen so the sun will heat the water bodies and the grounds and all of that um, and there is also some plants here so what we call evapotranspiration will happen uh, where some plants and water will also evaporate and um, and we also have um, the ocean and the rivers and all of that so what will happen then is that um, the sun will heat these things and it will cause convection to happen. So the water vapor will rise up, condense, form clouds. And uh, because it's moist, yeah, it forms clouds, condenses and all of that. And uh, rainfall happens again uh, as a result. Or you can think about it in this way. When it rains, water goes into vegetation, rocks and the soil, it also goes to the lakes and streams and the ocean. So what happens is that when it rains, all of these uh, parts of the earth will evaporate. So in the in the in the plant part of things, transpiration or evaporate evapotranspiration will occur and you will then have water vapor in the atmosphere and this water vapor will fall down as rain and snow back to the ocean, rivers, dams, lakes, rocks, and soil, and, and different streams as well in the ocean. Um, and the process happens over and over again, and that's the water cycle. Now, going back to what I emphasized on to say, um, Warm air is mostly moist, so there are instances where we have warm air, but this warm air is hot, or rather, is though it's warm or hot, it is dry, and that only happens when we have the formation of berg winds, or what we call fall winds. And remember, berg winds are due to anticyclones. And anticyclones are low pressure systems formed by cold air. So this cold air warms up adiabatically. So remember, cold air is always dry. So as this cold air is dry, and um, as it sinks, it warms up adiabatically. And as a result, you have hot air. Uh, though it is hot, it's still dry. Because um, it originated from a cold, dry system being an anticyclone uh, upper in the atmosphere. So that's what will happen. And that's the uh, that's something that we, we are going to discuss in the upcoming sessions, of course, uh, how these berg winds will form. Rule number five then goes back to what we partially spoken about to say cold air is mostly dry. So we must note that cold air is mostly 
However, again, you must note that I did not say always, but mostly, right? Because there are instances where we have um, cold air that is moist, cold or cool air that is moist, is moist, and that happens when we have the formation of fog. Yeah, so fog um, is a specific type of precipitation, and fog forms when we have um, warm air cooling down below dew point temperature, so it starts forming fog. Um, so those are the instances that I'm referring to. So you must note that, um, again, how fog forms is something that will be discussed in sessions to come, but the picture here shows us exactly how, um, wh what's this, what we mean by fog, right? So no, take note of that. Rule number six, warm air always converges. That's the rule. Now, what does that mean? Now, a simple way to describe how convergence occurs um, it's simply air coming towards a central point. So we basically saying warm air always comes to a central point. So if you look at the convection diagram here, it shows us exactly that. So we have warm air, right? So it's coming to a central point and then remember the previous rule, we said it rises. So that's exactly how warm air will behave. Um, it doesn't matter if we are looking at it in a convectional format or in a cyclonic format, a warm air will always converge. So it always flows towards a central point, central point of a cyclone. Um, and remember we said cyclones are closed pressure systems, uh, which means the center serves as the focus for conversion wind circulation. Um, if you look at it there, uh, you see that air is moving from the high pressure outwards. Um, as you can see there, and it is going into the low pressure system. So it shows us that low pressure system has a conversion center. Um, so low pressure systems, you must note that they are known as cyclones. That's an alternative name. Um, low pressure systems are cyclones. So in a low pressure system or with warm air, it will always converge towards a central point um, as the diagrams are, are showing here. So even though the air may be circulating, but it converges to a central point, as you can see in the diagrams over here. Which means the opposite is true with cold air. So cold air always diverges. That is rule number seven. Cold air always diverges. What does that mean? It means that cold air always flows away from the center of the system flows away while warm air flows towards the center. This one flows away of the from the center um, of the system. Flows away as we showed you in the diagram here. Um, and again, if you look at it here, um, it's flowing uh, away from there center of the system. So that's what happens in a high pressure uh, systems. And you must know that high pressure systems are also known as uh, anticyclones. And note that anticyclones are open pressure systems. So they are not closed pressure systems. So which means that um, the center is not uh, the focus where air goes. Rather, it is a, a divergent part of the side of, of the system. So divergent wind circulation happens there um, at the center of the system where air moves away from the central point. Rule number eight is the one we, we've said 
earlier and you were taught this in grade 10 to say the higher you go the colder it becomes um, so as the air goes to the upper atmosphere after being heated um, by the sun it cools down and why do we phrase it like that Just remember the sun will heat the surface and the surface uh, the surface's short-term radiation will heat the atmosphere. So the sun does not directly heat the atmosphere. It is the lithosphere or the Earth's surface that heats the atmosphere. So convection, um, the process we described, is responsible for heating the atmosphere. Hence, the higher you go, the colder it becomes, and that's what we describe here. So what will happen is that long-term uh, radiation will come and heat the surface and the surface will heat up the air there and this air will rise convection happens and it heats up our atmosphere so that's what we said here so in the troposphere that will that is what will happen um, as we described so please remember this rule very important uh, we apply it a lot in this section of work. Now, since the higher you go, the colder it becomes, it means the opposite is true. It means the lower you go, the warmer it gets. Um, and why is that the case? Now, remember, after the warm air has reached up the upper atmosphere, remember we said it cools down. So it means that after it has cooled down, since cold air is dense and always sinks, what will happen is that this cold air will sink and go back to the atmosphere and as it goes down it's gonna heat up and why because the earth heats the surface and the surface will heat up the air uh, the, the air as well and this air will be warm again and it's gonna go up and it's gonna be a cycle over and over again hence adiabatic heating happens as well so you need to note and understand that so you must note that conduction as a process leads to vertical heating of air while advection leads to the uh, horizontal heating of the air so these two things are not the same different processes when air moves horizontally advection happens um, and conduction happens as the air uh, will be vertically moving. Rule number 10, air will always move from high pressure to low pressure. Air will always move from high pressure to low pressure. That's what we described in the previous part. Remember in a high pressure system, air leaves the system. It flows out of the system and because it flows out of the system where does it go guys it goes into the low pressure system because air always enters the system in a low pressure system and that's what we call pressure gradient force so pressure gradient force simply states that air will always move from high pressure to low pressure and why does air leave the high pressure? It's because of diversions of air. Remember, in a high pressure system, air diverges. And because of that, it leaves the central point. It leaves the central point of the system. While in a low pressure system, it air enters the system. So convergence um, is the phenomenon that happens over there. So that's why that is true. Uh, rule number 11. Um, entails you understanding that air circulates differently in different hemispheres depending on the type of system so if you are looking at low pressure systems you must note that low pressure systems will circulate counterclockwise uh, counter means opposite right so they circulate opposite to how a clock will um, circulate in the northern hemisphere so they circulate towards that direction 
low pressure systems, and that is also known as anti-clockwise. While in a high pressure system, air will circulate in a clockwise direction. You must note those differences, guys. Um, in the southern hemisphere, the opposite is true. High pressure systems will be the ones circulating counter clockwise, while the low pressure systems are the ones who circulate in a clockwise direction. So that's what we have over there. That's rule number 11. Rule number 12 air current circulation and the wind movement are not the same guys please always remember that and that's how you lose your maths in exams as well now when we talk about circulation and when we talk about wind movement we are not referring to the same thing that's what we mean by this rule so when we make reference to circulation of air we are basically looking at the influence of the vertical pressure gradient force and this vertical uh, uh, pressure gradient force leads to the formation of what we call air current. So you note that vertical movement of air looks at air current. And what is air current? It's air that forms due to the uneven heating of the air, um, which influences vertical movement of air. So it goes back to um, this phenomenon, the earth receives an unequal heat from the sun, right? And because of that, um, the air uh, will then move from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure, um, circulating uh, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, depending on the hemisphere. But we know that in the northern hemisphere, air is deflected to the right so this air is deflected to the right uh, according to Ferrell's law as it rises it's deflected to the right and um, what deflects this air is the Coriolis force uh, which will lead to the formation um, of of certain systems right and um, and we know that it's very important for you uh, to understand these differences so when we look at circulation the vertical movement of vertical pressure garden force leads to the formation of um, air current so if you look at this diagram of ours uh, the sun remember hits the ground so we will have cold air in the ground this cold air will be heated up now since the air is cold uh, at the surface initially it means that at the ground we have the highest pressures and in the upper atmosphere we sort of have lower pressure or warmer air as the atmosphere gets heated up so vertical pressure gradient will will cause um, air current to form because remember air moves from high pressure to low pressure so what will happen is that now this air that is cold will be heated in the surface and what will happen to it, it will convect upwards, it will move upwards and after it moves upwards, it's going to lose its heat and gets cold now and after it is, it gets cold, it's going to sink, right? Now you see now we are focusing on a vertical movement of air. So it means now after it gets cold, the pressure, its pressure is now going to be high and it means now the surface will have the lowest pressure because the lower you go the hotter it becomes and so this air will be heated up again when it gets to the surface and it's going to rise and the process happens over and over again so that's what we mean by vertical pressure gradient um, force having an influence so what forms over there is what we call a current now air current guys is different from wind so we have a different instance still the same rule and the same rule requires you to understand now um, the different part of things 
So now, when we make reference to movement, remember in the other parts we are looking at um, circulation, right? So when we make reference to the movement of air, now the movement of air is influenced by the horizontal pressure gradient force. Now the vertical uh, pressure gradient force leads to the formation of what we call wind, which means air current and wind are not the same thing. Now air, air current is as a result of vertical movement of air. Wind is the horizontal movement of air. Now what is wind uh, formally defined? So wind is defined as the movement of air caused by again the uneven heating of the earth by the sun and the earth's rotation. So the earth's rotation is really responsible for the formation of wind. So the uneven heating leads to advection. Remember, advection is the horizontal movement of air. So as the air moves horizontally, it also gets heated up. Um, and we thus get to have global winds um, as a result. And those winds are known as westerlies and easterlies. So when an examiner asks you about the circulation, you think about how does air move vertically? How does it circulate as it moves in a hyperjet system? In the southern hemisphere, it will circulate in an anticlockwise direction. In the northern hemisphere, um, it will circulate in a clockwise direction. While with a low pressure system in the southern hemisphere, it will circulate in a clockwise direction, while in the northern hemisphere, it will be circulating in an anticlockwise direction. And that is what we refer to as the circulation of air current. When with wind, we are focusing on something else. We are looking at uh, the horizontal movement of air. So we are looking at the wind going in a westerly direction, southerly direction, easterly di direction. So that's what we call wind. And again, the deflection of this wind is influenced by Ferrell's law and the Coriolis force, which we are also going to discuss in one of the sessions. So that's what you need to know. That's what you need to understand um, with regards to this rule. Um, so maybe let's 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 sort of look at how that will uh, apply uh, in in a real sense. Now this diagram here is showing us vertical, sorry, the horizontal movement of air. So the horizontal movement of air may lead to what we call land breeze and sea breeze. And land breeze and sea breeze are examples of horizontal air moving. So we have during the day what we call um, during the day what we call um, land breeze. And why do we have land breeze during the day? It's simply because um, remember during the day we will have the surface heating faster than the ocean. And when the surface when the surface heats faster than the ocean, what tends to happen is that um, you'll remember that air moves from a region of high pressure to low pressure following pressure gradient. So the horizontal pressure gradient force will have an effect here. So it will cause the air, the cold air from the ocean to move towards the land where we have the lowest pressure. So that's what will happen. So air will move from a region of high pressure being the ocean during the day to a region of low, uh, low pressure, which is the uh, land. Um, in, and, and as a result, it will form what we call sea breeze, right? Now, thinking about what will happen at night is the opposite. So if you look at it at night, things are inverted. We know that this, the, the land loses heat faster than the, the ocean. So it means the ocean now is going to be a lot warmer than the land at night. So what will happen is that land breeze is going to okay. So land breeze now is now us having the highest pressure in the land at night and 
the lowest pressure in the ocean. So we'll have this cold air from the um, land moving to the ocean, and that's what we call land breeze. Again, under the influence of horizontal pressure gradient force. So it forms these two kinds of winds, being sea breeze and land breeze. And what causes that is the uneven heating of the earth um, during the day and at night time. So please remember this rule, understand this rule. It's very important for you to understand, especially if you are asked to describe how some of the uh, climatic conditions will form. You apply this rule. Um, understanding how horizontal pressure garden force has an effect and how the vertical pressure garden force has an effect uh, in the formation of air current and wind current being formed by the horizontal pressure garden force. Now, let us summarize. Um, We've said a mouthful. So in summary, um, you need to always remember the core rules. If you remember these rules, you will never, ever, ever, ever go wrong in climatology. Rule number one, to master climatology, always think about how air would act or behave. Under the influence of changes in temperature, and the chemical composition, and the different um, gases uh, that you will find uh, being layered uh, on the earth. Rule number two, warm air is less dense, thus will always rise. So remember the relationship between temperature, pressure, and density, right? Now, temperature and pressure are always going to be opposite to each other. When temperature is high, pressure is low. When temperature is low, pressure is high. They always opposite to each other. Same applies to density. When density is high, temperature is low. When temperature is high, density will be low. So that's how it works. Rule number three, Cold air is more dense, thus always sinks, applies the rule I just described now. Warm air is mostly moist and will always rise. Remember that it's moist. Uh, cold air is mostly dry. Warm air always converges. It comes to a central point. Remember, warm air is formed by an, an, a closed system of circulation. Cold air is formed by an open system of circulation, so hence cold air will always diverge. Remember, the higher you go, the colder it gets. The lower you go, the warmer it gets. The opposite is true. Why the higher you go, the colder it gets? Because the sun does not directly hit the atmosphere, but it directly hits the surface. Hence, the lower you go, the warmer it gets, simply because the surface being heated by the sun directly, and the surface will then heat the atmosphere. Air always moves from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure, that is pressure gradient force. Now, the air circulates distinctly or differently in different hemispheres depending on the pressure system. So, a cyclone or a low pressure system circulating in an anti-clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere, but circulating in a clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. And the, an, an, an anti-cyclone or a high pressure system circulates in a clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere and in an anti-clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere. The last rule says air current circulation and wind movement are not the same. So air current circulation and wind movement are not the same. So remember, air current is due to the vertical movement of air, which leads to the air circulating. So when you are asked about circulation, you tell us whether it's clockwise or anti-clockwise. 
and because we are focusing on vertical movement of air now when we're looking at um, wind uh, or movement or rather when we talk about movement we are looking at the horizontal uh, behavior or movement of air so that leads to the formation of wind um, under the influence of course of advection um, depending again on the layer uh, it is found so these two phenomena are not the same so please remember the golden rules they are golden because they will make your entire climatology make sense and be so 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 easy for you so please remember the rules and always use them as you work through the work in this section Thank you very much for tuning in grade 12. Um, our grade 10 and 11 revision continues in the next session where we'll be looking at how can you then apply all of these golden rules in the global air circulation system. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is Mr. P. Mbuisa again signing off. See you in the next session, session number three. Thank you. Audio jungle.